Well, brothers and sisters, this is the final sermon in our series on 12 spiritual disciplines. And uh, today's sermon is about worship, which in a way encompasses all of the other spiritual disciplines. For it is worship when we employ or use or participate in any of the other spiritual disciplines. Let us open in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, please guide us as we dive into your word. Please open our hearts and minds that we may hear what you would have us hear. And Lord, may this, this message, this delivering of your word be for us an act of worship today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, before we get into the question of why worship or how to worship, we need to understand what worship is a little bit. And so this week, instead of just two questions, why worship and how worship, we have three questions. What is worship and why worship and how do we worship? Worship for us is an old Word. It comes out of the old English word worship. I have no idea whether I'm saying that correctly. But this old English word shifted over time to worthship. Worthship and then to just simply worship. In other words, when we worship, we are uh, ascribing worth to someone or something, in this case, of course, God. We are giving him worth. We are saying that he is worthy, that we acknowledge his worthiness. And so that's, that's what that word means in the broader sense. But then there are three basic ways that we use this word both uh, both in our biblical translations, but also in the way that we talk on a regular basis. Worship is, in one sense, what we do to the glory of God in all of life. This is very biblically rooted, and we read in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, these words, 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. See, Paul is, is talking about how worship is, is not just something that we do spiritually, <clears throat> and it's not something that is just limited to our worship services or whatever, but rather it is something that is viscerally physical as well. It is something we do with our whole bodies, our whole being. Worship, in this sense, is what we do in all of life to glorify God. But we also use the word worship in a different way. We use the word worship as in the worship services that we participate in. This is all the stuff that happens when we gather together on a Sunday, or as in this case, all that happens when we watch and participate in a playlist on YouTube it, it includes, uh, you know, the, the, everything from the prelude music that uh, Dorothy plays at the beginning of the worship service through to the, the benediction and the handshaking that happens at the end of the service. That is a worship service. And so we talk about worship in that way. But then there is a third meaning that is very, uh, very, very specific. It is the specific act of adoration or praise. And mostly when we're using worship in this sense, we're talking about 
uh, music often, right? We sing worship songs. We're going to have our worship time during the worship service, right? Um, we often refer to music there. But it can be any act like bowing in prayer or holding our hands up to praise or uh, what have you. So given those three definitions of worship, worship in all of life and worship services and worship as specific acts like the songs we sing, why worship? Why are we called to worship? Well, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31, where Paul writes to the people of Corinth, says, So, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of of God. Paul makes it very clear there that we are to worship God, give him glory, ascribe to him the worth that he deserves in everything we do. Not just singing praises, not just, you know, doing um, doing the prayers or the blessings or whatever, but everything, eating and drinking included. John, in the book of Revelation, says this, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. See, this is why Paul can say that we need to worship in all areas of our life, because God is worthy. God created all things. And not only did God create them, but listen, they were created and have their being. God is sustaining them even now. So even as we worship together in far-flung parts of, of Athens or the surrounding area or the world, it doesn't matter. We are doing so, and we are only capable of doing so because we were created by God and because he is currently sustaining us even so. So, of course, that raises the question, how do we worship? How do we worship? We worship, uh, we're going to talk about this in reverse order. We're going to talk about this in terms of how we worship uh, in those specific acts. We worship in praising and adoring and singing to God. And, and this is true regardless of circumstances. You'll notice as you go through the Psalms, as you read through the Psalms, that often David or other psalmists are facing terrible uh, struggles in their lives. And they're pleading to God for his help. But yet they still, they still praise God even in the midst of their trouble. There are seven Hebrew words for praise, or that we translate often in our scriptures as worship or praise. And, and these seven words are all connected, um, but they have slightly different meanings. And so how do we worship? We worship by halal which is the same, uh, it, it is the root word of the word hallelujah, right? This has its meaning, it says, to be clear, to praise, to shine, to boast, or show, to rave, to celebrate, to be clamorously foolish. And, and that's a real challenge for us. Many of us have that uh, Northern European dignity thing going on in our, in our lives. We want to be, uh, do everything in decent and good order, which is, which is great. But there is something exuberant and outwardly foolish to a lot of people about how we are called to worship. Think, think about, think about the young man who falls in love and who, who can't stop 
talking about it, this girl that he loves, this person that he loves. He waxes on and talks about this person so much so that his friends want to want to shut him up permanently. They want to stuff a sock in his mouth to get him to stop talking about it. To be clamorously foolish, some might say. This is how we are called to worship God, to be halal, to worship God in this way. Another word we have is yada, which is the extended hand or to throw out the hand, therefore to worship with extended hands, to lift the hands. And I know, again, this is another struggle that we have sometimes in our church, in our staid and, and proper, dignified sort of way of doing it. And you don't have to do this. However, it is biblically very, very valid to raise one's hands in praise, to say, God, thank you. You are so good. And I worship you. Tauda, which is an extension of the hand in adoration, a vowel, or acceptance. Thank you, God. We do this, we see this sometimes when people receive God's blessing. Or when they are praying, they offer up themselves to God. Right? We, we offer we give our hands in adoration, acceptance, or a vowel. Shabbat, which is to shout, to address in a loud tone, to command, to triumph. Right? It is that, that, that triumphant cry that says, yes, thank you, God. Thank you. Barak, to kneel down, to bless God as an act of adoration, or to salute. We see this in, in churches where they have kneeling benches built into the pews, that there are periods during the service where everyone will kneel down to pray. And again, we don't practice that all that much in our formal worship settings, but maybe you do at home. But again, it is a biblically sound and valid way to worship God. Zamar, to pluck the strings of an instrument, to sing, to praise. Of course, we sing and praise to God all the time in our worship services, but maybe there's opportunity for you to do that at home. Maybe there's opportunity for you to do that. I know there's opportunity for you to do that today during this worship service online, but there's also opportunity throughout the week to sing to God, to praise him in that way. And the, the seventh word, the Hebrew word for worship is tehillah, or the, the singing of halals, to sing or to laud, that is to praise or glorify, right? There's, there are all these words of praise and worship written into the scriptures. And they are all ways in which we can worship our God, in which it is totally appropriate and good to worship we worship also, of course, in our worship services. Not only do we have those seven words of, of specific praises and worship that we can do uh, during our worship service or throughout the week or whenever, but we also do our worship services, the whole thing, not just the singing part of it. The whole worship service is an act of worship. We worship, first of all, together. The Bible is very clear about that, that we are not to neglect the gathering together. 
Now, that gathering together, we happen to be doing virtually these days, but we're still not neglecting it because it is so important. It is important for us to gather together to strengthen one another in our praise and worship of God, to encourage one another, to give one another wisdom from the scriptures and encouragement from our experiences, and to pray for one another, to uphold one another throughout the week. But when we gather together, whether it is virtually or physically, we are worshiping when we pray, we're worshiping when we sing, we're worshiping when we confess, we're worshiping when we receive the assurance, we're worshiping when we listen to scripture, when we participate in litanies, when we receive the blessing, when we receive God's greeting, when we greet one another, when we give our tithes and offerings, when we participate in baptisms or when we participate in the communion, when we hear the word preached, all of these things and more are worship. It is what we do together. Even if we are grieving together, if we are mourning, if we are struggling, that too is part of worship. And we worship, last of all, in that broadest sense. We worship in everything we do. We worship when we are making our breakfast. We worship when we wake up in the morning. We worship when we are going out into the field or going out into work or going out and doing whatever it is that we're doing. We're worshiping when we stay at home and do nothing as we've been told to do so many times these days. We worship in so many ways. Now, this is where the discipline part comes in and the discipline part comes in for the whole thing thing, right? None of these things are proper forms of worship if we are not conscientiously choosing to worship and praise God. All of these things can be empty, or they can be worshiping something else, or they can be worshiping ourselves. When we sing our songs, are we thinking to ourselves, boy, I sound pretty good today. Or, oh, I wonder what that other person is thinking about the way that I'm singing. Or, or I feel so awkward singing in front of a TV. Or are we actually offering up our worship songs to God? In the specific acts of worship, when we are praying, are we trying to show off like the Pharisee in the temple who is standing there praising God supposedly and saying, thank you that I'm not like other people? Are we showing off when we worship? Or, or, or are we... Are we worshiping something else? Are we worshiping ourselves, our status? Are we worshiping our reputation? And, and that goes not only, of course, for how we are um, how we are worshiping or not worshiping in those specific acts of worship during a worship service, but the whole time too. We we hear this sometimes that that people will say of, of this church or that church or the other church, they'll say, well, I'm not getting anything out of it. But really, that misses the entire point of the worship service. It is not about what we get out of it, but rather it is about the glory we give to God in the service. It is about the love that we give to him in gratitude for what he has given to us. Properly speaking, it shouldn't really matter to us what the style of the singing is, or how good the preacher is, or how smooth and lovely the service is, or anything like that. None of that should really matter. What really matters is what I give to God 
what we give to God, are we worshiping Him? If that is our focus, then the style of the worship, how smooth it is, how professional people are, how uh, talented the, the praise team leaders are, and all of those things, they slip away as being not ultimately important. Instead, my offering to God is what is important in response to his love for me. And that, of course, is true not only of the specific acts of worship and the worship service itself, but it is also true in life in general. It's a discipline. We, we sometimes have to force ourselves to say, I am going to worship God, even though I really don't want to do this, even though I really don't enjoy this, even though my circumstances are so bad. I don't know about you, but but Tuesday morning is, or no, Thursday morning, excuse me, is garbage and recycling here in the village of Athens. And I really do not like gathering and putting out the garbage. I don't know why, it just drives me nuts. But that is my choice, ultimately. I, I mean, it may make me feel yucky to put out the garbage. I don't, I don't know if that's inevitable or not. But I can choose to do the garbage as an act of worship, or I can choose to grumble and complain about it in my mind, and maybe out loud, the whole time. It is a discipline, a choice that I make. And it may be a choice that I need to make many times. Even if the garbage only takes me five minutes, I may have to choose every 30 seconds to make it an act of worship instead of something that I despise doing. It's the same with anything else in life. Dealing with an annoying boss, having to pay bills, changing diapers, changing a tire, fixing farm equipment, or, you know, whatever it is you do. There is the opportunity to discipline yourself, ourselves, to worship God in that thing. But it is not worship if we do not make it worship. If we go around claiming that everything we do is worship, but we're never actually choosing to worship God in those things, then, then we're just lying. Then we're just making, <laughs> making a fool of God, if that were possible. For, of course, he knows what is in our hearts. Brothers and sisters, this is the spiritual discipline of worship. And it is so well summed up in that passage, passage from Corinthians. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Let us do that this week and beyond. Let us pray. Father in heaven, help us to see that all that we do is properly supposed to be an act of worship. And help us to more and more choose to worship you in those things that we do. God, Lord, help us not to you know, beat ourselves up or, or feel terribly guilty if we forget or if we fall off that bandwagon but instead help us to get up again and worship you again through the power of your spirit. 
Thank you, O God, that your mercies are new every morning. That it's not as if we have failed today and therefore are shut out of your kingdom forever, but rather that you offer us grace anew through your Son, Jesus Christ. That you are even now working in our hearts and minds to make us new, to renew us in our minds. Father, you are worthy. Jesus, you are worthy, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. May we worship you in spirit and in truth, in all that we say and do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.